OK, Rory, what we, uh, what I'm going to do now is go back to the very early days and the famous story of the four pounds, what was it, four and ninepenny guitar or something in Woolworths and all the rest of it, and back to the Fontana and the impact in Eric, Kittinger, er, Eric Kitteringham and Norman Damery. So could you fill us in on the 1964-65 era? Uh, oh, let me see. 65 was the beginning of taste. Yeah. Uh, well, 64, 65, I would have been probably playing with the show, the show band at that stage. Um, it was called the Impact Show Band, and it was also known as the Fontana Show Band. And also masqueraded as a few other people. Well, uh, like, y- your influences yeah. since the very beginning have been in blues and rock, so why did you play in a show band? Well, I started at, s- at school, I tried try to get a, a little rock band together, but there was literally, there wasn't a youngster who could play the bass guitar around. So we did one or two gigs with just two guitars and drums, and it was sort of ventures and rock and roll material, Chuck Berry. Yeah. Um, so really out of frustration, just to play regularly, I just joined a show band. Um, I was only 14 or 15, so I, you know, and it was a chance to play through an AC30 Vox, which I thought was... You know, the, the, the biggest thing that could happen to you. And then it was one of those show bands where you could play sort of 50% rock and roll anyway, and uh, then the usual mixture of rock and pop, so, or country and western rather. Um, you know, at that age I was still learning, so I mean, a couple of years in a show band didn't really offend me, but eventually it, it just got too frustrating and I wanted to do the real thing, you know. And that's where Eric and Norman came in. Uh, well, yeah, well, I, I went to Germany with two other guys uh, as a three-piece, and we were called, well, we did a gig as the Fender Men. As in the Star Club in Hamburg? Uh, no, this was called the Big Apple Club, and um, that was the first sort of group situation, but then it was literally for that one spell, and then I went returned to uh, Cork, at which point Eric and Norman uh, were splitting up their group, which was called the Axles, and uh, we got together... And it's uh, and that was taste really. That was sixty five. Yeah, sixty five, yeah. sixty six. So like yeah. a, a few years later, then like all these very strange, supposedly underground bands kind of came in. A cream in particular, mm. were the three piece band of all three piece bands. Mm. Now taste were to be the other three piece band or to be the main three piece band. So like I mean, could I say that your influences were more almost jazz like as opposed to rock like with cream? Yeah, is jazz I- fair enough to say? I don't know, really. The thing is that you know, Cream became the big, the big hit, and and Jimi Hendrix, and so on. But you know, Taste started off more on the lines of Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. That type of well, that was a four piece, but three instruments or the big three from Liverpool. Um, you know, I'd, our inf- you know, there's so many influences. We didn't sort of stretch out the numbers to twenty minutes like the Cream did. Yeah. And they're set with. I think they did about four or five numbers. We did. Uh, you know, the influences crept in all over the place. A little bit of jazz, a little bit of folk, a little bit of blues. It was it wasn't as heavy as Cream, and it, it wasn't as uh, it was a little more arranged than Hendrix music. So, well, uh, is it fair to say that you specialise like in interpretations of say blues standards, like Sugar Mama and things like that? Um, and well, that, that, like, <laughs> that, that and in in such a way that that might have been the difference between taste and Cream. Um. Not really. I think the the, the cream that they're almost the, their complete set initially was was um, blues, all blues standards um, brought up to date. Roland Tomlin, um, things like that. We did a couple of uh, old classics updated, but all all the rhythm and blues groups were doing that. So um, let's say that the, the songs that I wrote um, were kind of uh, were, were different, you know. So I think we kind of had a balance between the updated blues or rhythm and blues stuff and whatever I was writing which was a kind of a mixture of all kinds of things you know? yeah I could never re- I, I, the fact there was three members that's about the you know and there's a blues bass that, that's the connection with Cream and all those people but really we didn't even you know I was more interested in Chuck Berry and, and Eddie Cochran and people like that well then what was happening then around the time of the McCracken and Wilson taste like that was say late very late 60s uh, well, they left say in 71 yeah, well, the the second Mark II of Taste, if you call it that, uh, was 1968, the autumn of 68. Um, John and Richard came in. They both played together in a show band called uh, Derek and the Sounds. And uh, John had been with them for a while as, as well. And um, it was in a, around that time, uh, we moved to London as well and eventually yeah. got a contract and got a few breaks at the Marquee Club and a few other places. But it was a long... 
a long stretch. And of course, with Eric and Norman, I did another stint back in Germany and uh, a couple of weeks passing through England, getting the odd gig. Yeah. And playing to all over Ireland. Well, like well. you had been commuting from Ireland to Hamburg, say, and then London became the place to go to, like, and the place that you finally made your name, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, like, what was it like going to London at the very beginning? Did you ever feel it wasn't worth it at all? Did well, you ever feel frustrated about the whole thing that was never going to happen? Well, it was really bleak then. I mean, you have to remember the fact that Van Morrison and them, okay, they were an Irish group and had a hit record and so on, but they split up very early on, and the. the the channels to get gigs in England were very, very hard, and uh, so we, we had a lot of waiting around. And that's why we went to Germany, really, um, because you had the clubs there who would take groups, and uh, but then you had to work sort of ridiculously long hours. And but then you, for that, you got to play what you wanted. You know, we just played rhythm and blues and rock and roll and every, anything we could play all night and it was it was better grounding really than, than doing 45 minutes in a, an English club yeah but obviously at that time London was the the mecca of music so well yeah, yeah, had right. to do it that way you know well around that time you played with one of my favourite bands you played on a tour with Blind Faith mm -hmm. yeah. and you also like I, could I say that the most important part of your career around that time was the Isle of Wight Festival which went down a bomb yeah yeah like, was that as good as people say it was? I wasn't there. Just the atmosphere, the sound, oh, the whole, Everything. Well, it, it really was. Like, it was special, yeah. Was. Like, and what happened afterwards as regards, right, okay, Rory Gallagher is now hot property. Did it happen after <laughs> after uh, the other wife? Um, I, the, the, you know, the band was, was very popular, really, on the continent and in Britain and so on. I think it's only that the press only woke up to the fact that we, yeah. we weren't just some sort of... Uh, fluke group playing around the clubs and we, we just went on the Isle of Wight and uh, uh, the audience just took off and um, and of course it frustrated them then, then when they found out that we were splitting up you know just as they were yeah, the press exactly. was sort of really discovering us so to speak um, but then the, the Blind Faith tour that was the that was 1970 I think we did that one and only tour they did we did about six weeks in the States so that was a great break for us but was that the first time you played in the States? It was yeah yeah but that was a scream because uh, Clapton and Winwood and all those they decided to do the tour um, a la Glenn Miller you know get back in the the Greyhound bus and so on because the cream and traffic had, on the earlier tours had gone in jets and all that yeah. but so we had to go along with that idea with uh, Delaney and Bonnie and friends Blind Faith and ourselves in the one bus and um, covering long journeys and so on and I mean for us we had the very first gig we did was Philadelphia in, in the, the spectrum there and we stepped onto the stage and the stage started revolving and the promoter didn't tell us. And there we are playing in front of 20,000 people. There was more people than we'd ever seen. <laughs> the stage is never... I, yeah, I mean, I thought this is... This has got to be sort of, uh, I don't know, a bad trip or whatever they called it. So, uh, But it was it was good, a good experience. But we had more fun on, on tours after that because we were yeah. more in control of our well, own uh, scene. <laughs> Pretty good for a Sunday morning. What's going on is what it's called. That's from Taste on guitar and vocals, of course, Rory Gallagher. And we're looking back through the archives of some of the stuff that we did. This is from 1980. And this is uh, talking to Rory Gallagher, who would have been 79 days ago uh, at the very beginning of March. Uh, I got on to talking to Rory about the idea of having other band members and having to accommodate their styles. You know, was he not tempted to just have his own style in the studio and it just be, you know, I don't know, Rory Gallagher all the way? If I want to make records on my own, I could go in with a rhythm machine and play a bass as well. I don't. I mean, I want to play with musicians who enjoy playing the songs and you know and add their personalities to the music. So it's uh, you know I don't like. I wouldn't like to be Stevie Wonder. Let's put it that way. Okay, yeah. that's good enough. <laughs> well, listen. Look, before I do play this song and before you do take a sip out of that cup of tea, there. Yeah. There's one. <laughs> there's one thing I would like to say, and that is that around this time, around '73 or thereabouts, when poll winners' concerts and poll winners' type things in magazines meant so much, yeah. Rory Gallagher was voted number one guitarist in Melody Maker as the best guitarist of the year, with all the rest of those luminaries behind you, right? Mm -hmm. So, like. What did that mean to you in terms of like what you could have capitalised on, say, like say being aloof from the press and being like not talking to anybody and suddenly releasing an album with the big press conference and everything? Why didn't you do anything like that? Or as you put it one way, I don't want to swing out of the chandeliers on top of the pops. Oh God, you're remembering quotes that I can't remember. Uh, 
why didn't I what capitalize on on the, the yeah, polls? Is it like uh, why didn't you make yourself into the A League as opposed to just being Rory Gallagher and the hard working man and all the rest of it and the hardest gigging musician in the business and the people's guitarist and all that rubbish? But it's, it's the press guys just put those t tags on me. I regard myself as an A musician and in the A League, but I don't feel that um, I should you know that I'm in the B League or the Z League, and I don't believe in leagues and uh, to be in the A league doesn't mean you have to wear a velvet suit and a yellow hat and uh play a white guitar tonight and uh, and don't play for the next 4 years and you know I hate all this pop star routine and and, and all this malarkey particularly at, at that time I just wanted to if I was top guitar player fine whatever that meant if I was you know you you know your own quality you know whether you're playing well that week or that album or this or that you know what I mean and uh you know, I was delighted to see I was, you know, voted high in the in the polls. But then, you know, you look at the polls and you you, you see uh, one of your own favourites not even in there. So you, you you can't get carried away with them. But I don't know. You're a pop artist if you capitalise on every little thing that happens. But I, I you know, I think if you overcapitalise on things or you become too political, you know, it's 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 no fun anymore. You know, it's it's you'd be better off joining the Conservative Party. I'd rather just. Play, you know, if, if you get a couple of um, slaps in the back or, you know, a poll here or there or a reaction, it's fine. But, you know, the, let's put it this way. My mind, the playing of music is, is a busy enough thing. It leaves very little time left to be kind of playing a chess game with the public or playing yeah. a chess game with the press. I don't think, you know, I think there's too much of that in my own view. I, I'd like to be a little more naive and just let it happen and see, where you, <laughs> see what happens. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Dave Fanning in the Rock Programme on RT Radio 2 until 10 minutes to 2 o'clock. It's now 8, almost 9 minutes past 1 o'clock and I'm talking to Rory Gallagher at the moment. The next track I'm going to play is not from Rory Gallagher at all. So any fans or any people who don't like Rory Gallagher can turn up the radio. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> well, listen to me, Rory, then. About your influences, then, a stupid question. Just like, who are they? What are they? And what's it all about? Like, when I mentioned blues interpretations earlier from what you were doing in 65, who are your influences? Oh, the list is as long as my arm, really. It started off with Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, Chuck Berry, Elvis, people like that, then Fats Domino. Oh, you know, I, I see myself as a fan of, of so many people. In the, in the blues field, it's people like Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, Muddy Waters, uh, Blind Boy Fuller, um... Oh, people bronzy. You know, quite a... Well, then, I listen to so much stuff. I could listen to, you know, any given week, I could, you know, spend a night listening to blues stuff. And the following night, I might listen to Waylon Jennings, people like that, you know, Johnny Paycheck. And the next night, I might be listening to Bert Jansch, Martin Carthy. And the next night, you know, it might, it might be Costello and The Jam, Herman Brood. It, it really varies like mad. Well, one yeah. person you have mentioned there is Lonnie Donegan. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Lonnie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, he he kind of goes without... He was... My initial, uh, he was t he was the, the real sort of source point influence for me because he was he was really I don't know he just had great fire and he did all the sort of American Woody Guthrie type songs which really sort of as a youngster I thought they were fantastic and I said, even though you know, Lonnie still has a lot of fire left in him yeah. it's just that he's you know his career has gone more towards cabaret and so on but uh, way back then those records were steaming you know were great. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you've also played around, like, what's it like doing different stuff outside of the Rory Gallagher band? You've played with Muddy Waters and the London Sessions and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I know, it's, it's a great holiday for me to play. And I did a couple of tracks on the Muddy album, and I did one or two with Jerry Lee and Lonnie. And it's great because, you know, there's sort of a responsibility is off your shoulders, and you can just become a guitar player straightforward, and you play more or less what's, you know, what's suitable for the particular artist mm. you know it's it's, and you so, learn an awful lot from these people you know particularly Muddy because I mean just being in that fella's presence you, you learn you know the way he tunes his guitar the way he talks the way he sings and yeah. uh, you know because like as well like last night now in the stadium I saw B.B. King in concert mm. did you listen to a lot of his music in the past as well? Uh, no I prefer the, the well I've listened to B.B. and Freddie and Otis Rush the, the, the kind of the so called modern blues players but I, I like the kind of Slightly rougher players like you know Elmore James and uh, JB Hotto and uh, well, what about the guy we're playing next then? Slim Harpo, I like him a lot. He's just sort of he's, you you can hear a lot of Mick Jagger copies his voice a lot. I think or used to do, 
but just the uh, this is kind of modern blues but he, he had his own sound a lot of tremolo was used in the guitar and it's a great number called Tip On In Tip On In it is you mentioned the engineer earlier on now we were talking about Juice earlier on the second album you, like you said it took a long week as you put it yourself with a like a crate of Guinness and just getting into the studio yeah. for, for that long week now take someone like Alan O'Duffy yes. who has been producing you recently and he said like that you are a perfectionist yeah. so like how do you uh, call yourself a perfectionist and also only just take one week to record an album well when we did that album Juice that was with an engineer called um, Robin Sylvester uh, who later went on to do various other albums it was done in an 8-track studio a reggae studio at the time believe it or not called Tangerine Studios and um, well things were done f fairly fast because at that time I wanted to sing live and play live lead guitar and make it as organic or whatever the word is as possible whereas in recent times I'm uh, quite prepared to sort of sing you know overdub the vocal or overdub lead guitar and so on but then we're, we're working 24 track now uh, which takes longer to mix and uh, this kind of thing but I, you know so, you know the more albums that you make the more keen you are to improve and, and you know you learn and you make a few albums that you're not that happy with and then you try to make up for it with another one it's, it's nothing wrong with being a perfectionist but you certainly can go over the top and so really what I'm going to do next time is go back to 16 track or 8 track even and uh, you know just try and work a little, sort of a little more to the point but I think uh, if you give yourself certain limitations like you know more rigid studio yeah. sort of things and less time you, you might get a little more uh, of a spontaneous sort of thing well speaking yeah. of spontaneity then like live on stage next Saturday you, you're going to walk up on the stage in Tralee yeah. now 13 years ago say or about that time I saw you in the Stella house <laughs> in Mount Marion right yeah. now is the enthusiasm still there is it still the same oh yeah it's it's well I still, I mean, that's just, In other it words, doesn't seem like 13 years to me. What makes Rory words. Gallagher tick? I mean, like, how is it? Time makes, I know, I know. Um, you know, since I was a child, I just love listening to music and I love playing it. That's as simple as that. I don't, you know, you watch Seamus Ennis or something, who's late 50s or even older than that. He's late white. 90s. Well, I'm being kind to him. Uh, but, you know, you are talk about Muddy Waters. I mean, it's the energy's still there. It's just just becomes more mature and so on um, you know and you know contrary to what, what people think the more you do uh, the more accomplished you become the more experienced you become the more you learn that you still have a lot <laughs> to learn and you have to hone the music down and get to the point and it's, it's, it's simplicity it's the same old cliche I know but well in, in other words then like if you tour somewhere say like the States and having to travel so far on the Greyhounds or on the aeroplanes or yeah. whatever and the hotels and all the rest of it does it, it like is it all worthwhile when you stand up on stage is that when it really makes yeah that makes sense let's go on to the next date after that oh yeah well uh, definitely I mean the, the point is if I wasn't doing it on stage I'd be playing at home I'd be playing at a club it's um I think that I, I, I don't I'm one of those guys who's not too you know you find musicians cribbing about aeroplanes and travel and all that it doesn't bug me so much I enjoy it and I like seeing you know it's easier than enjoying the Navy to see the world you know and you see these different places and you get a chance to see different players and you know I enjoy travelling and it, 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 it never kind of wears me out to the point where I don't enjoy the show